Yeah, it's a privilege for me to share a, a short word with you this evening. And I've titled my, titled my message, It is Time to Discern. It is Time to Discern. So I need some buying you. Everyone say, and on YouTube, it is time to discern. It is time to discern. Amen, amen. That famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once said, discernment is not a matter of simply telling the difference between right and wrong. Rather, it is telling the difference between right and almost right. Okay? Let's go to the Word of God. I have two passages I want to kick off with. Always good to go to the Word of God. Amen? Always. Ephesians 5, 6 to 10 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were in darkness, but now, now you are the light in the law in the Lord. Walk therefore as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Here comes the kicker. And try to, disturb, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Right? You got that? Keep that one, eh? Now we get to Romans 12 verse 2. And everyone knows Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, everyone say testing. Testing, you may discern. Say discern. You discern. What is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? Testing, discern. Amen? Right, great. So folks, these days it is pretty foolish to believe everything we're told and much of what we see. Lies and deception go back thousands of years. They were used to, te to tempt Adam and Eve, right? And the enemy and his associates have not changed their tactics. Our world is filled with false doctrine and deception. Now what's the difference between judging something and being judgmental towards someone? Or maybe the difference between judging and discerning? Have you heard someone say, I know what the Bible says, but. I know what the Bible says, but. That's a red flag straight away. Okay? Because we can rest assured that God will never lead us contrary to his word. Right? So the motives and the teachings or the behavior contradict scripture. We can know for sure it's not of God. Not of God. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, there's a pretty good indication that he is a, a duck. Amen. So we take a moment to consider the doctrines being promoted and encouraged today. We live in this sort of anything goes society. People are taught to be their own person. And wait, hang on, wait for this one. My truth. My truth. What does it even mean, my truth? It's just the truth. Amen. Amen? A lot of cloud and stuff and foggy stuff happening here. Let's cut right through it. This is live as you please mentality. You know, we've almost been brought up to believe your accountability rests just in your personal happiness. And man in the world continues to deny the existence of God and the means of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is exactly what Satan desires. If he can create doubt and confusion, resulting in unbelief, he has achieved his goal. Let me give you an illustration of discernment. Who's heard of the Lone Ranger and Tonto, by the way? I'm just giving my age away. Okay, a few people here. But anyway, just go with me on this one. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> I guess the Lone Ranger and Tonto, they, they stop in the desert for one night. They get out their tent, set their tent up, 
and get inside the tent. And both men fell sound asleep. So some hours later, Tonto wakes a Lone Ranger up and says, Lone Ranger, look towards the sky and what do you see? And the Lone Ranger replies, I see millions of stars. And what does it tell you, asks Tonto. So the Lone Ranger ponders for a minute and says, Hmm, astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. And it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. And time-wise, I'd say it's about quarter past three in the morning. And theologically, it is evident that the Lord is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. And Tonto, what does it tell you? So Tonto is silent for a minute and says, Lone Ranger, you are dumber than I thought. What it really means is, someone stole our tent. <laughs> and that, folks, is discernment. <laughs> but then again, when, when Tonto calls the Lone Ranger dumb, that's been judgmental, right? So we need to be discerning in life without being judgmental. I know it's difficult to sometimes separate the two, as we can see by Tonto's response. So in Matthew 7, 3, it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? What is Jesus saying here? What is he saying here? He says we need to discern ourselves and judge ourselves, not others. So often we point our finger at someone else's, at someone else, and um, sometimes we're a bit more guilty in our own lives of some, kind, of some sort of sinful behavior, right? Someone wrote, why is it that my, that my dirt is never as dirty as your dirt, from my perspective? My sin never seems as sinful as the sin of others either. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. This is a reference point. I have a log in my own eye and find it quite easy to ignore it, but the speck in your eye is quite obvious. So what's the point here? Jesus is saying, don't judge others. We've got more problems of our own, by the way. <laughs> a lot of problems of our own, like giving other people trouble, you know? Let's just go back to discernment. I'm digressing a bit here. Biblical discernment is not some mystical, psychic feeling, or some cosmic disturbance, or a burst of wisdom that gives the born-again Christian the ability to look into someone's heart to discern their struggles. What's it got to do with? It's got to do with upholding God's written word, the Bible, right? And having the ability to compare someone's beliefs and teachings to the Bible. So that's your standard. The Bible and the word is your standard. That's the only way to peer into someone's heart, right? What about discerning evil? So Matthew 7, 6 says, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then, tear and then turn and tear you to pieces. So folks, the, the dogs and the pigs of Jesus' time were not quite what we think of today. I mean, we're not talking Lassie and Miss Piggy here, Right? Those days, the dogs weren't the nice, domesticated puppies we have at home. The dogs of those days were wild, feeding on garbage and roadkill. They were absolutely viewed, dogs and pigs were viewed with absolute contempt. Pigs were considered unclean, and no self-respecting Jew would go near a pig. So what's Jesus saying here about this? He's saying about discerning evil in life. Evil in life. There are some people who treat the gospel and all the things having to do with God and Christ with scorn and contempt. Another, another, another little story for illustration. So during a cold winter, a farmer found a snake 
and he was stiff and frozen with the cold. And so the snake says to the farmer, if you pick me up, hold me to your bosom and your body will make me warm. So the farmer says, but hang on, if I do that, you're going to bite me. So the snake says, hey, why would I do that if you save me? So the farmer had compassion on the snake. And taking it up, he placed it in his bosom. So the snake was quickly revived by the warmth and resumed the nat his natural way of living. And what did he go and do? He bit the farmer, inflicted on him a mortal wound. So the farmer cries out, why did you bite me after I saved you? So the snake answered, you knew I was a snake when you picked me up. You knew I was a snake when you picked me up. And with his last breath, the farmer said, I'm rightly served for taking pity on a scoundrel. So folks, if you cozy up to a snake, you're liable to get bit. Discernment. Not everyone want, everybody wants our help. And not everybody wants our opinion. Oh, I've got to watch myself on that one there. I love giving an opinion. Discernment. Discernment. We need to discern God's truth. We've got to distinguish between fact, fiction and non-fiction. And you know what? This is the important thing. Finding God's peace amidst the chaos. Finding God's peace amongst, amidst the chaos. His truth amongst the lies we're living today. John 8.32 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you, will set you free. And where does this freedom come from? We talk about freedom, setting you free. Where does it come from? It comes from discerning and knowing God's truth. Discerning and knowing God's truth. But how do we discern God's truth, we may ask? The answer is pretty simple, it's so profound through his word, through his word, and the guidance of, his, of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, God's word is the ultimate truth. It's a standard against which all information should be measured. Amen? All information. You know, when we immerse ourselves in the Bible, we equip ourselves with the truth making it that much easier to discern God's truth in our daily lives. Folks, we live in a world that is, the lines are getting so blurred, so blurred between truth and falsehood. We get bombarded by information from all sides. Social media, news, friends, family. And yet, and here it comes, even our own thoughts and our feelings. So in such a chaotic information environment, discerning God's truth can be pretty challenging. I'm sure we can all attest to that. But this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit, a helper, a guider, who guides us into all truth. John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit helps us to discern God's truth in our minds, in our hearts, enabling us to understand and apply God's word correctly. We know that the Bible warns us to warns us that Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of lies. And what does he do? Use, use deception to lead us away from God's truth. He takes God's word and he twists it and appeals to our fleshly desires. Right? Therefore, discerning God's truth requires us to be vigilant, to be sober-minded, to be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We don't have all the answers, and our understanding is quite limited. And therefore, we need to depend on God for wisdom and understanding. Proverbs says, tell us to 
tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So when we humble ourselves before God, humble ourselves before God, he promises to guide us into all truth. What does that involve? Daily seeking God. Daily seeking God. Studying His Word and walking in the Spirit. Amen. And as we grow in discernment of God's truth, we then experience the freedom that comes from knowing the truth. That peace that surpasses all understanding and the joy of walking in God's ways. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. We should ask God. Ask Him. And when we get our wisdom from the Lord, we will be discerning in life. Discerning. Not judgmental, discerning. We'll discern the good from the evil, but at the same time, leave judgment to God. Amen? Let's look at some examples of some folk lacking discernment in the Bible. So there goes Samuel. He goes to visit Jesse's house to anoint the next king. You know all the story. So Jesse parades all of his sons by Samuel, and Samuel sees one of the sons, Eliab, and says, Oh, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. This was Samuel. But maybe he's not armed with, armed with discernment here. What did God say to Samuel? Man looks on the outside... I look at the heart. Amen? Brothers of Joseph, they perceived him as a problem. He was actually their provision. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, sees Joseph as a conquest when he was actually the savior of the nation. No discernment. You know that discernment can lead to a blessing? A blessing. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? They respond. And then when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter operates in, a, in discernment here. And he says, some don't perceive you correctly. So they hold you off as a good teacher or a prophet. But I receive you differently because I perceive you are the son of the living God. Wow, so Jesus sees the sermon here in operation. And he blesses Peter because of it. He says, blessed are you, Peter. Blessed are you, Peter. So when we learn to discern, we get blessed. Let's look at some keys. You want to look at some keys to discerning? Amen. Firstly, you must learn a person's heart. Learn a person's heart. Remember the two accounts of betrayal? Two accounts of betrayal? Peter and Judas? We focus on Judas as a betrayer, but the truth is that Peter was as much of a betrayer as Judas was. One major difference. One major difference. Judas had a bad heart. Peter had a bad day. Eh? Judas had a bad heart. Peter had a bad day. Okay? So Jesus teaches us that you've got to get rid of Judas and you restore Peter. Get rid of Judas, you restore Peter. But you know, some of us, due to lack of discernment, are getting rid of the wrong people. We kick folks to the curb because they had a bad day. They had a bad day. However, if they have a good heart, let's extend some grace and peace to them rather than having a war with them. Amen? And some of us are keeping folks around that have good days, but their heart is corrupt. Folks, we need to, keep, we need to discern the company we keep. We really do. Now we enjoy the compliments and the flattery and the tension and all that sort of stuff. But if we don't know their heart, we don't know their heart, 
and we ignore the knife sometimes in the hand, and then we complain about a few stab wounds in the back. Whew. So some of us are treating a Judas like a Peter, and then we're treating Peter like a Judas. We need to learn their heart, learn people's heart. We might just dismiss the wrong people. So let's dig deep, dig deep, and ask for the spirit of discernment here. Secondly, another key, listen to a person's mouth to what they say. Listen to a person's mouth to what they say. Because out of the heart, out of the, out of the, heart, the mouth, the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. So when a person opens their mouth, they give a little bit of insight into who they are. And what we do is we tend to ignore what we hear. So whatever comes out, it, it isn't a bad day issue. It could be a bad heart issue. So let's go back to the battlefield, battlefield in, the Garden of Adam, uh, in the Garden of Adam and Eve. No discernment there. Eve should have known she was talking to a snake. Why? Because poison was coming out of the snake. Yet we continue to treat snakes like sisters and bow constrictors like brothers. What's coming out of their mouth? What's coming out of their mouth? Only two options. Life or death. Two options. Life or death. That's how simple it is. If it's gossip or rumor or anger or spite, criticism, they speak in death. Now Adam, he's not off the hook here by the way. Not Adam, he's not off the hook here, gents. What was he doing there? He was just standing there. He was just standing there. He did nothing to point out to Eve that the snake was a snake. All he had to do was listen. Listen. Listen long and carefully and you can hear the difference between sweet nothings and hissing. Watch this as Jesus uses these keys to discern. The thieves on the cross with Jesus. Same location, what came out of their mouths allowed Jesus to recognize that they were in fact miles apart in their heart. Miles apart in their heart. By the words that came out of the repentant thief, Jesus was able to discern his heart. Amen. Discernment. What about outward appearances? What about outward appearances? John 7, 24 says, Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right, a right judgment. Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. We so easily judge by outward appearances. The world might do this, but they aren't living in the grace of God like we are. So it's not okay for us as born-again Christians to do that. So we think of a biker with jeans and a leather vest and tattoos and piercings and long hair and they got the goatee and you see this man at night and you have a certain feeling of fear that comes over you because your first impression was, man, he's the last person I'd like to meet in a dark alley. Then we think of a man, he's clean shaven, nicely cut hair, dressed like a pro, very fashionable, charming smile. And good in the eye, as I would say. He evokes a certain feeling of admiration. And your first impression is pretty positive, isn't it? So the first man, the biker, is actually a pastor. He's leading the ministry, making difference in hundreds of bikers. As he reaches out to bike gangs, and he has an NGO feeding the homeless. The second man I described, and I'm really going back in time, is Ted Bundy. And for those who don't recall who Ted Bundy was, he was a serial killer who killed dozens of women in the 80s. And you know the major reason that they took years to catch him was his outward appearance. That's what took him years to catch this guy. So outward appearances do not tell the whole story. Not the whole story. It's actually a very false standard. 
really is a false standard. Right judgment can only come from Jesus Christ. So folks, if we can't get past the outward appearance of something, how can we have a discernment to know the working of the Spirit in that person? Another story. Three pastors, they've gone fishing together. So they decided they're going to confess their secret sins to each other so that they could pray for each other. So the first pastor shared that his secret vice was gambling. And the second pastor says, oh my goodness, you know, now you say that, I've actually got a lust problem. And the third pastor looks at the two of them and says, you know what my secret sin is? It's gossip. And I can't wait to get back to church and share what I just heard. Folks, discernment. Be careful what you share with and who you share with. Then, of course, you get what we call false discernment. And this is a struggle we all face. Slow to hear, quick to speak, and quick to anger. Slow to hear, quick to speak, and quick to anger as well. That's false discernment. So it's out of this attitude or the overflow of our hearts that our mouths speak and we act. So from the heart, the mouth speaks, the mind thinks, and the eyes see. Life, as we know, it's based upon the condition of our heart. Condition of our heart. And this is critical. Very critical because the gifts of the Spirit and the voice of God in us flows through our heart before being presented to the world around us. So simply put, if our heart's not right, if our heart's not right, our presentation of the gifts of the Spirit will not be right. We're not going to be effective. Not going to be effective. And sadly, we're not going to find ourselves on the right side of spiritual warfare. Not going to do it. Not going to happen. Sorry. Ain't going to happen. So that when the heart does not have peace and is full of chaos or unrest, you're not going to hear God. You're not going to hear God. If a heart is bitter or angry or ambitious or harboring strife, we cannot trust our judgment either. We must reach that place in peace, of peace, in order to hear God and have his discernment. I want to say that again. We must reach a place of peace in order to hear God and hear his discernment. Amen. So folks, we need to take a stand against the sin in our lives and encourage others to defeat the sin in their lives. In the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. And as we conclude, God says in Jeremiah 1 verse 12, He has promised to watch over His word to perform it. Watch over His word to perform it. Amen. So let's stand and declare God's word over us. And for those on YouTube, please join us in this declaration. Let's stand. So just repeat after me. Lord, I pray that I keep growing in knowledge and understanding so that I can recognize and treasure what is excellent. I pray that you continue to reveal to me what really matters so that I can live a pure and blameless life. I pray that I'm not stagnant in my knowledge of you. Instead, 
Let the revelations be endless. Let the discernment occur daily. Let the discernment occur daily. Let my mind and my soul be completely aligned to you. Lord, just as you told Samuel to not look at appearances or height of a man's stature, I pray that I too look not on outward appearances. You do not see how a man sees, but you look at the heart. I pray that I too look at life on a deeper level and understand that there is more than what meets the eye. I pray that when making decisions, I approach them with spiritual wisdom and sensitivity. Lord, like Solomon, I pray for your divine wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Lord, I know that it is because of you that I, that I can make the right decisions in line with your will and your purpose. So, Father, I ask for the spirit of discernment to enable me. I ask for the spirit of discernment to, a to enable me to make sound decisions that will guide me in standing for truth and for righteousness. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen.